So, uh, before I get into that, before I get into uh, hemorrhoids, fissures and fistula, I'd like to digress a bit on to bleeding per rectum and its association uh, with these disease entities and also talk a bit about colorectal cancer, uh, the incidence and how, because I will tie it in later on to how it relates to fissures, hemorrhoids as, and, um, and fistula as well. So, uh, bleeding per rectum is a, is a topic that we know from our student days. We know it's a hot topic, it's a long case, uh, the MCQ topic whatever and in day to day practice this is probably be your bread and butter uh, presentation in a in a surgical or a colorectal clinic uh, now just have a look at this data this is from the gobokan data and if you look at the this is from 2020 and if you look at it uh, colorectal disease uh, cancer takes up uh, the third place uh, in the incidence of cancers and in sri lanka again from 2020 from the national cancer uh, control program data both amongst males and females, colorectal cancer comes in at number three. And this looks again from the NCCP data from 2020 shows us the increased incidence of colorectal cancer. And you can see from 1985 to 2020, there is an exponential rise. Now, this rise may be because there is more cancer, also because we are diagnosing it more and our investigation modalities are better. But what we need to consider here is that it is on the rise. And this is more concerning. If you look at it, this is an, the x-axis shows the age and the incidence again on the on the y-axis. And you can see that we used to think that colorectal cancer, as all cancers, was a disease of the elderly. Yes, it is a disease of the elderly. But if you look at the point at which this curve is now beginning to rise, it is in the age group of 30 to 34. And uh, the SEER data shows that by 2030, we are looking at 138% increase in Colorectal cancers by uh, in in patients younger than 45 years of age. So uh, I'm showing you this data to show that a uh, colorectal cancer is an important uh, issue. It's very co it's common. It's on the rise, and it is no longer a disease of the elderly. And also, as you know, it presents with bleeding per rectum. And why this overlaps with today's topic is that fissures, hemorrhoids, sometimes even fistula also present with the same uh, bleeding per rectum, as you all know. So we need to think about our approach to these diseases, the benign disease, disease even with colorectal cancer as a differential diagnosis in the background until proven otherwise. So that is the message I want to get across there. And we talk a little bit more about it as we go along, right? So uh, back to basics, um, I'm sure you've seen this before, you studied it in your undergraduate uh, classes. Um, so this is the rectum, this is a uh, coronal section of the uh, inner rectum, the canal. So you have the rectum which terminates in the inner canal and you have the levator ani which forms the pelvic floor and the ischiorectal fossa on either side and the buttocks at the bottom here. And uh, here you have the dentate line below which there is a lot of sensory fibers, sensate and above that is asensate. So all the things we are going to talk about today are confined to this area. So you'll be seeing a lot of this picture. So please bear with me, right? So hemorrhoids occur above the dentate line. Um, fissures occur below the dentate line. And fistula usually terminate at the dentate line at the internal opening, but can open in multiple other tracts in other places. Also, it can open in a variety of places. Uh, in, in this whole complex. So having said that, let's move on to hemorrhoids. So hemorrhoids, it's very, very common. I mean, I, I know the anal cushions, the hemorrhoids, you know, they are, they are, they are in all of us. They form a fun, they uh, have a function of uh, us being able to differentiate between platus and gas. They don't really contribute to continence, but they have a sensory role. And uh, if you take 10 people, up to 8 people will have enlarged hemorrhoids, but it may not be symptomatic. So not all hemorrhoids are symptomatic. Uh, so it's a very ubiquitous disease. So if you look at the symptomatology of um, hemorrhoids, bleeding per rectum is the commonest, right? Uh, presentation of a lump at the anus, it is there, but it is not very common. And the classical feature of the bleed from a hemorrhoid is that it is painless. 
So painful bleeding is unlikely to be associated with hemorrhoids. So that's something you should know unless there is a prolapsed thrombosed hemorrhoid. So it should be painless. Then on uh, examination, just a cursory examination from the outside, an inspection of the perineum alone does not allow us to diagnose hemorrhoids unless it is prolapsed and thrombosed or prolapsed in that sense. You will always need to do an internal examination. And in that internal examination, a digital rectal examination with a finger does not allow you to diagnose hemorrhoids either because hemorrhoids are venous cushions, there is an artery component, but they collapse. So you cannot feel a lump. So the diagnosis of hemorrhoids is based on proctoscopy. You have to do a proctoscopy to diagnose hemorrhoids, right? So that is very important because we get a lot of patients who have been diagnosed at hemorrhoids with no proctoscopy, sometimes not even a rectal examination and there is nothing outside. So it is just on the fact that they are having bleeding PR that they have been treated as per hemorrhoids. But in fact, there is a more sinister pathology above it. So the message I want to drive across at any level of practice, it doesn't have to be in a surgical practice, GP level, right, clinics, in a community level, in MOH clinics, wherever. If you, if a patient presents with bleeding per rectum and you want to say it is hemorrhoids, the only way you can do that is either to see it outside or do a proctoscopy. A digital rectal examination does not allow you to confirm your diagnosis, right. So that's something I want to mention. And if these patients are presenting with bleeding per rectum, you will always need to consider colorectal cancer. Just because the patient is young, you should not say, okay, this is, I mean, it could be unlikely that agreed on that point. But if you do not have the differential in the background, you can miss a, uh, miss a uh, case of a colorectal cancer. And as I showed you in the chart earlier, the incidence of colorectal cancer in the young patients is on the rise, right? So pa patients even after 30, 40, you will need to think that, okay, is this patient having a malignancy? Should I investigate it more? Right, so uh, with regard to the natural history, hemorrhoids, the etiology, you know, it's because of straining. There are, there is people, uh, there is, uh, it is due to straining. Some people may have connective tissue disorders, which may lead to this, but it is prolonged straining uh, and constipation sometimes, obstructive defecation in extreme cases, where over a period of time you get uh, larger and larger hemorrhoids and based on the size the presentation may vary right majority of hemorrhoids are asymptomatic but when they are symptomatic it is bleeding or prolapse lump so if you look at this diagram this is a close up view there are two types of hemorrhoids the internal and the external the internal ones which arise above the dentate line are the, they may hang down or may hang out uh, those are the ones that we classically call hemorrhoids the internal hemorrhoids the external hemorrhoids which are outside in the perianal skin. They are not really hemorrhoids per se, but they are hematomas. They are collections of blood because of a ruptured blood vessel inside the skin. And they can be acutely painful, right? Uh, depending on the amount of tissue tension inside. So that is a hematoma. That is completely different from an internal hemorrhoid, which needs to be diagnosed on proctoscopy. And the treatment is completely different, okay? So, uh, with regard to gradings, the classical grading that we use is a grading of 1 to 4. Uh, grade 1 hemorrhoids are hemorrhoids which occur internally and even on straining or passing stools, they do not come out. Uh, visible only on proctoscopy. Grade 2 hemorrhoids are ones which will come out uh, at defecation but spontaneously regress. Third degree ones are ones that come out and need to be manually reduced. And grade 4 ones are procedential where they are outside permanently and they cannot be reduced. So this sort of grading is useful. It's not purely academic, but it is useful to take a clinical decision as to how to move forward and how to treat these patients. So what are the treatment options, right? So uh, do all hemorrhoids need to be treated? The answer is no. Uh, an incidental finding of an hemorrhoid just because you see it on proctoscopy when you've been doing it for some other reason doesn't mean that you need to treat it. You, if you see it, you don't need If it's symptomatic, then you will treat it. By symptomatic, I would mean bleeding. Or if the lump is prolapsing and the patient, his lifestyle is affected because of it. Or the patient has discomfort after passing stools and they want something done about it. Other than that, you would probably not want to intervene on a hemorrhoid. So 
if the patient is bleeding say once a month just a little bit of spotting and you know for sure the hemorrhoid is the only source then even in that patient you can consider maybe not actively sort of invasively treating the patient but if the patient is bleeding on a day to day basis the hemoglobin is dropping then obviously something more acute needs to be done so if you look at the range of therapeutic options for hemorrhoids there are many so sclerotherapy banding and hemorrhoidectomy are the sort of mainstays the the workhorses uh, sclerotherapy is the injection of uh, phenol in olive oil uh, which will act as a sclerosant and this works for small hemorrhoids it does not work for the larger ones because the volume that is required to sclerose this is large and generally grade 2 and above sclerotherapy generally pro- probably won't work so i would probably say sclerotherapy is a good option for uh hemorrhoids grade 1 hemorrhoids which are symptomatic banding banding is a office procedure in the west we don't really do it as office procedure here sometimes we do it in a correct clinic but it's essentially the application of a rubber band to the base of the hemorrhoid so uh now i know there are some people who do this in gp practice um but you need to be careful uh, the reason being that you are applying a rubber band to the base of the hemorrhoid here to knock off the blood supply to the hemorrhoid allowing it to shrink to devascularize and then eventually slough off and fall off that is the end point now if you put a band here right and you mistakenly put it including the anaderm using it uh, where there is a component of the rubber band which is below the dentate line that is going to cause severe pain for the patient and it will not stop until that band is taken off sometimes if there are large hemorrhoids and you forcefully put a band try and push it up and put it sometimes those bands migrate and by migrate at the time you put it you don't get pain but they go home and they have severe pain so you need to be very conscious of whether the patient's hemorrhoid the base where you are applying it is going to be uh, in the correct position the other thing is patients who have, are on aspirin and clopidogrel aspirin is not a problem that much but certainly clopidogrel dipyridamol and some of the newer uh, anticoagulants you can have problems where the band can erode through and you can have intractable bleeding so you need to be very very careful of uh, what you do when you do banding so my point is uh, uh, spero uh, banding is a very good option right the results are very good it can be done as an outpatient no admissions if you do it properly this pain free but if you don't do it properly you can run into trouble if you don't select your patient so therefore if you are doing it you need to be properly trained and you need to have enough experience to pick the hemorrhoid that you should not be banding it's not a one uh, one solution fits all right so you have to be very very careful on that so that is something i want because we see patients coming in with improperly applied bands and complications so that's something to avoid hemorrhoidectomy is the uh, gold standard surgery for hemorrhoids and usually we reserve it for larger hemorrhoids which are not amenable to banding ones which are grade 4 which cannot be reduced because without reducing it you can't do a banding and if there is a significant skin component or a anodermal component in that hemorrhoid you go for a hemorrhoidectomy um so the hemorrhoidectomy uh, it's sort of notorious as a very painful operation post op the pain but if you do it right uh, minimizing the tissue damage and the amount of uh, energy used to cauterize the tissue uh, and you have adequate post op analgesia enough laxatives and you warn the patient ahead of time generally the results are fairly good sometimes you have to do two three hemorrhoids in the same patient so those are more technically challenging ones uh, which is sort of out of the scope of this discussion but uh, the the message i want to get across is that hemorrhoidectomy is now uh, if it's done properly it can be a fairly reasonably comfortable experience and if the pain is well managed you know patients are quite happy with it so the main aim of treating these hemorrhoids is to make the patient asymptomatic and to select the modality in which the recurrence rate is minimal so you want to do something where it won't come again but if the patient is continuing to strain or the etiological factors are there the chances are he will have a recurrence so if you look at these three options the hemorrhoidectomy offers you the least so the lowest recurrence rate but then there again it, it requires an anesthetic it should not be done under local uh, and therefore it is a ward admission so it's a much more cumbersome process but for the appropriate uh, for the appropriate hemorrhoid that is the gold standard now if you 
uh, are in touch with these things. There are multiple other options coming up: the laser hemorrhoidectomy, stapling, various things, right? But they, you know, they come and go because of various problems. They, it's more of a pad, and they then they disappear, come back again at some point. But these three options, these are the three workhorses which have been there, tried and tested, and they have been proven to be efficacious, and they've been there for decades, if not more. So these are these are if you take a hospital setting. These are the ones that we do on a daily basis, right? So if you have a patient who is bleeding PR per rectum, you do a proctoscopy, you see hemorrhoids, and you treat it, right? And we'll say within the next day or two there is no further bleeding. Can you be happy? Can you stop there? The answer. I'm going back to the data I showed you earlier. The answer is no. Right? Depending on the patient, I mean, it's a very young patient, 18 years old, versus a patient who is in his 70s. The way you think about it is different, because we need to always think: okay, hemorrhoids are common, therefore, eight out of 10 people will have it. But is the uh, is there a malignancy about it, and am I missing it? That thought has to always be in your mind. So you'll always go into the other symptoms in your history, like uh, family history, altered bowel habits, mucus, all of that. But if nothing is there, even then. Uh, probably in an age group of, a, of about 35 and above, these patients would probably warrant a sigmoidoscopy because um, if you have a tumor there, the proctoscope will see only up to here, it will miss the tumor anywhere above that. And the bleeding that you see from the tumor, you will misinterpret as the bleeding coming from the hemorrhoid. Okay? So you would always want to treat it, that's fine. But at some point, either pre treatment or post treatment, the patient would probably warrant a, at least a flexible endoscopy. Uh, to check up the left colon because 60 to 70 percent or maybe up to 75 percent of colorectal malignancies occur in the left side. If the patient is having other red flags like an altered bowel habit, mucus in the stool, iron deficiency anemia uh, or a very strong family history, then probably a flexisig is not enough. The patient may warrant a full colonoscopy. So you need to check, uh, sort of go into detail on the patient. Bleeding per rectum, always think of malignancy. Okay. Right, so um, anal fissures, uh, again, a very, very common uh, complaint that patients come with, probably even more common than hemorrhoids. So it is, as I mentioned, something based below the anoderm, and this anoderm is very, very sensitive. There's a lot of pain that comes from, from pathology in this area, and essentially a fissure is a tear. So if you, uh, just like there's a mucosal lining here, and you pass a hard stool across that, and that stool will cause an injury, a laceration in the anoderm, which will then hang out most often as an anode tag, and you will have a wound there, which causes the main symptom is pain. Now, uh, so the symptom that the patient will complain of is painful defecation. There may or may not be bleeding. Some people bleed a lot, like streaks is what we classically describe, but some people have drips. Some people have a excessive amount of bleeding and if you take patients who have on clopidogrel or dipyridomol or something like that, they can bleed a little more than usual. So on examination, you will probably, you may see the fissure or you may just see the skin tag and it is always important instead of just looking at the anus alone, you need to slightly open out the anal uh, canal with your fingers and have a look and usually in a patient with suggestive symptoms at the 6 o'clock position, you will see the bottom end of a fissure, right? Some people have a lot of pain, some people don't have that much pain and the degree of how much pain will determine how much they will allow you to examine. So some people will not allow a digitation at all. Some people you can even go on to a proctoscopy and that depends whether the acute fissure is there or a chronic. Anyway, that's out of this one. So the main thing here is pain and that pain is the one that facilitates this fissure not to heal. Why? Because the healing of this is impaired by stool passing through it all the time and also the vascular supply in the anoderm is not that good. So uh, we'll go into a little bit of detail on that. So how you approach the treatment is based on your understanding of why these fissures don't heal and also the patient should understand it as well because otherwise they will not comply with your treatment. So when you have pain because of a fissure that causes a del delayed defecation. What do I mean by that? Because patients have pain at the time they go to the toilet, they try and avoid going to the toilet. And which means that the stool is there in the upper rectum and the sigmoid colon. 
water is absorbed out and the stool becomes hard. So the patient defers going to the toilet and at the point where they cannot hold on any longer, they pass out the rock hard stool. And that stool obviously will cause injury to the uh, already injured uh, anal mucosa. Right? Similarly, because there is pain, right, the patient's resting anal tone is slightly higher. That will facilitate the poor healing but also make the anal canal smaller. And I mean, if you think about it, if somebody is there pinching your anus or you have pain at your anus, your natural tendency is to contract it. So in that situation, you will be passing out a rock hard stool on a narrow anus, which is going to cause even more trauma than in a normal situation. So what happens? You are going to keep on this vicious cycle and it's going to cause trauma to the anal canal and that's going to cause more pain. So it's a vicious cycle. So the way we treat it is to break the cycle. Uh, without breaking the cycle, there is no option of uh, properly treating this patient. So where do we break it? We break it at the pain, uh, at the incidence of pain. We try to relax the inner canal and we try to make the stool softer, all with the in intent of making the passage of stool more comfortable and less traumatic, right? So if you, uh, for the pain, what do we do? We use a, a local analgesic, uh, local anesthetic gel, so lignocaine, xylocaine, whatever you like, and the patient should apply the gel where the fissure is, right? There is no point applying it outside where there is no fissure because it is a local anesthetic. It works where it acts, sorry, where it is. So that is going to be about a, about the size, length of a phalanx inside the inner canal. So unless you instruct the patient properly to do that, the patient will never do that because it's painful to put the finger in in the first place. So you need to instruct the patient, okay, this is the reason you're doing it and then they will comply. Uh, so that uh, analgesic, the anesthetic gel should go in five minutes before going to the toilet. You pass tools, wash up and you apply it again and that will prevent the post defecation pain also, which can be quite severe, last for about three to four hours. The next thing is you can... Uh, Reduce the stiff soft, uh, hardness of the stool with a stool softener. You can use a laxative, but then they can have runny stool, so a stool softener may be better. Cremafine is a nice balance because it offers that the paraffin acts as a softener as well as you are able to control more less bloating. So they, they find it easy to pass stool. So you have to tell the patient all you need is a soft stool, not runny stool. So you advise him, okay, you titrate it just to have a comfortable passage. That's it. And then with regard to the inner canal, we need to dilate it a bit so that it allows easier passage of stool, so reduce the resting tone. And we do that with nitrates. So it's a low, topically applied nitrate, which will be uh, um, applied in the form of a gel. And as all, as all nitrates, the initial doses will cause a headache uh, because of the pressure drops. But that is after about two, three doses, it stops. So the first initial doses, you ask them to take it with the paracetamol. Because otherwise what happens is the moment they, play, they get a gel, they stop using it. So you need to show this cascade, you need to draw a diagram, explain to the patient where the fissure is, talk about these things first and then tell them how we are treating it and why they need to comply exactly with the way they instruct it. So that takes time and you have to explain it in a way that the patient understands. If they don't understand this, if you don't tell them in detail how to do this, they will never comply and the fissure doesn't heal. So the main reason that fissures don't heal with conservative measures is that we don't take the time to explain it to the patient and they don't comply. So most, almost do all of these, does it work for all fissures? Well, 70 to 80 percent of the time it works, right? So the pain will stop in about a week, but you tell them to continue this for about three weeks because that period of time is taken. The nitrate will help reduce tone and increases blood supply to the fissure and it will uh, facilitate healing. But there are a percentage of fissures which don't heal and it, recurrent uh, you know, trials of this conservative measure doesn't work and in which case then we need to go to the second line treatment options which are Botox. So you inject a little bit of Botox into the intercentric groove. It's, it's quite expensive so it's not available in Sri Lanka for this purpose. Or we do what's called a lateral anal sphincterotomy where we release uh, diametrically opposite or 3 o'clock or the 9 o'clock position, we release the internal sphincter a few fibers up to the level of the fissure. So that reduces the resting tone, improves the blood supply and the healing is much, much better. 
but 70 to 80 percent of cases your conservative measures if you instructed the patient correctly it will work so the other important thing is that once you heal the fish and the patient is happy if they go back to their bad habits of not eating fiber if they don't drink enough water and they go back to having constipation and heart stool they will get a recurrence so you need to instruct them okay once it's healed keep your stool soft you don't need to be reliant on a laxative just uh, drink adequate amount of water which is about at least two to three liters of water per day fiber in the form of uh, uh, green leafy vegetables and uh, fruits right so fissures as i mentioned occur mainly at the six o'clock position because of the the, the physics of that canal as well so it, it ruptures there if you start seeing fissures in abnormal places that is the three o'clock uh, nine o'clock positions or where it is not common then you need to think is the fissure being caused by something other than uh, hard stool it could be due to uh, Crohn's disease which is associated fissures and that can happen in a small percentage of patients we are diagnosing Crohn's more and more and perineal Crohn's is a different entity you don't uh, you don't operate on those patients because in a Crohn's patient in a perineal Crohn's if you mistakenly operate it's you're going to end up with a flare-up so that needs to be treated separately so your suspicions should be uh, 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 awakened if you get a fissure that is not healing or it is there in an abnormal position so that's a message that I want to uh, send across right um, so with regard to fissures and hemorrhoids they commonly present with bleeding PR always think about uh, colorectal cancer in the background in before you diagnose these things in your uh, in your workup so if a patient is having bleeding PR if they are above the age of 35 maybe 40 definitely if it's above it you need to think about offering the patient a flexible sigmoidoscopy for reasons that the incidence is going up and you'd want to pick up uh, early stage uh, malignancy or a benign polyp which may convert later on so you need to know right um, so that's those are the probably the two commonest perineal surgical diseases that you will get now perineal fistula is a different entity it is uh, it is uh, it's part of perineal sepsis and it can be a simple problem and it can be an extremely complex problem uh, which can be very very difficult to manage so there again back to our diagram of the anal canal so as you know fistula are epithelium lined uh, epithelium lined uh, tracks right which open between two epithelial lined surfaces so this is what it would look like on a cross section but this anatomy can change and I'll explain how so if you have an anal gland here, you can have it submucosally, you can have it in the intersynteric region. There are glands and those ducts, if they get blocked or there is some problem there, you can start getting a small focus of sepsis. So it's an abscess. Uh, so where that abscess, sometimes difficult to pick early in the disease, but that abscess can progress and it becomes bigger and then bigger. Some of them may present with acute pain as a perianal abscess. You've seen all of them, they are, patients are in severe pain, they can't sit, they are, they are febrile sometimes, and they have a painful lump at inspection. But remember those perianal lumps, those, uh, those abscesses, the infection does not come from the skin this way. It comes from the anal canal this way. So that is why they have anaerobic organisms. So what happens if you leave it, these abscesses will eventually rupture and you will have pus pouring out. Uh, if the patient presents early or earlier to a surgical unit uh, or a GP in some instances, they will put a knife into it and drain it, right? So now essentially what has happened is now this abscess cavity, which has started from the inner canal, now has an external opening, right? Because you either it's ruptured on its own or you made an incision. So that over a period of time, this pus, the bulk of the pus will go out but over a period of time that might convert into a fistula so that fistula may be just a fistula tract only or it may have a small abscess cavity in between and this abscess may be uh, a simple one a linear one or it may have multiple branch tracts or um, it could be low that is below the sphincter or it could be intersphincteric going across the sphincter or transphincteric right across the inner sphincter so that anatomy can be very variable and usually you can pick it only on examination and analysis you put a probe into it etc. So 
uh, it's one of those things that you need to really really work out um, the importance of this, this is called the Parkes classification the importance is that if you don't identify the anatomy correctly the treatment process that you will initiate which is surgical may have catastrophic results one is that if you now what are the treatment options one is to like a draining an abscess a fistulectomy where you cut across the skin right up to the fistula and lay it open now if that track was going across the anus sphincter and you cut it you transect the muscle and which ends up with a patient with no fecal continence or reduced fecal continence so that can be a catastrophe and you won't realize it until much later or you don't take the track properly and you leave a piece in behind you're going to end up with a recurrence of the fistula which means more sepsis more scarring and there will be branch tracks while there's a lot of inflammation you can probe it in an inexperienced hand you put the probe halfway through you don't realize that it's turning this way you put a put extra force and you end up creating a false track up here so now the simple fistula becomes a complex fistula so there's a lot of variation so what happens is that the patient will now end up with a non-healing wound persistent drainage sometimes they have issues of uh, local abscesses in that area they can have bleeding and they can have a lot of discomfort so um, therefore a lot of there, there are quite a few treatment options for this there again just like hemorrhoids some are uh, sort of mainstay work causes the other ones are uh, more they come and go as fats but basically the work causes are a fistulotomy where we lay it open in a very low fistula a fistulectomy where we call the fistula and preserve the inner uh, sphincter muscle and now we tend to do we do that primary inner, uh, inner flap repairs along with primary muscle repairs which needs a bit of training to do that uh, but they have very good outcome and if the if the track is going above a sphincter there's a lot of sepsis and you don't know really what you're doing then the bailout method is to go for a seat on placement which is a thread passed through the track and brought outside which will act as a wick like a like a, 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 a oil lamp you put a thread into it and by capillary action the pus will come out and the helping the pus come out means that the uh, infection will settle to a degree not completely but that when the infection settles or reduces the inflammation reduces the track becomes more organized and the uh, definitive surgery like a fistulectomy or a fistulotomy, fistulotomy will become better now some of these things are more complex they recur a lot uh, they have a branch tracks there are various complications we have to do MRIs to find the tracks so in those ones we do what's called a video assisted fistula, uh, uh, fistula tract ablation waft where we pass in a fiber optic scope into that or there are options of laser fistula ablation where you burn off the track and let it close up the results of that are a bit dodgy so it's not really in common practice uh, and there's something called the lift procedure where we transect the fistula so these are all more surgical uh, colorectal topics but I just want to show that there is, there's an array of tools the fact that there's an array of tools means that this thing it can't be easily treated and it can be quite complex so it's something that you need to think about so if you have a patient who you are suspecting a fistula you need to get that patient to a uh, person who is trained to deal with it and who deals with it on a day-to-day -day basis for the simple reason that it can be messed up very very easily and in these uh, things in fistula especially the first attempt at a treatment is the best attempt because the more you keep on doing it the more scarring there is the more complex the track becomes and the more difficult it is to uh, get a proper clearance and a, and, a, uh, and a proper treatment sometimes the sepsis is so bad and the recurrence is so bad that we need to do a colostomy to defunction that whole area to control the sepsis so those are extreme cases and even then sometimes we can't control it and this is not really a disease of the elderly it's a disease of the young so it can be severely affect the quality of life of young patients right so you need to be very careful uh, you should not mess around if you are not trained don't do it because you can create more trouble than there already is right so short lecture uh, that's all i want to say um, I'm open to any questions.